What's worse at a dinner party, sitting next to a snob or a bore? Oh, I said a bore. <laughs> because a snob at least has personality? Yeah, exactly. And because you might have a laugh. Right. Yeah, especially that. Well, by that time, Truman was a really close friend of mine. And um, he'd taken me to see several stone concerts here in the garden. So he said, uh, the Rolling Stone magazine uh, asked Truman if he would write their tour. And so um, he was thrilled and delighted. And so he said, honey, you got to come. <laughs> um, and so I said, I would adore to. Um, and so that's how it started. I can't remember how many cities I went to. And you slept on a tour bus? Yeah. In the bunk beds? Yeah. <laughs> I'm imagining that. Going backstage was always wonderful as they were tuning up and exercising and screaming and uh, you felt such an air of excitement. Mm. How was Mick Jagger? How is he? How, yeah, was, how, he? Was, how was he? Oh, how was he? I think the way you'd expect him to be. Um, absolutely the leader, always in command, the one that the one that stayed so straight so he could command everybody, keep everybody else under his control, or under control. Did you find him sexy? I can see how people found him sexy, but I found him a little repulsive. <laughs> <coughs> you hated Miss Porters, didn't you? Oh, yeah. But I always hated school, but I really hated Miss Porters. Very rah, 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 and, and their teams must win. And even at Chapin in, in New York, I will never forget, I was terrible at sports, and I was always the last to be chosen for a team, <laughs> which was so embarrassing and made me feel pathetic. I was miserable, so I took my mother's high heels and my dog, a Bouvier de Flon, and um, walked across the Triborough Bridge uh, saying, I'm going to escape, I'm going to get out of here. I realized I couldn't go much further, and I didn't know where I was going in any case, and um, so I turned back. And of course, when I got home, as usual, I was punished. Um, but the punishment wasn't um, half as bad as the punishment for uh, trying to adopt an orphan. Uh, I was left alone at this enormous house of my mother and stepfather in McLean, Virginia. Uh, they were off deep sea fishing in Chile. How old were you? About 11. And um, I was just so lonely. All I did was play in the woods with my dogs day after day. Where was your sister? At boarding school. And um, so I had a very fat cook called Nellie was my only friend. And I uh, decided I couldn't stand it any longer, so I looked up in the yellow classified pages, orphans, orphanages. And um, so I saved my, took my pathetic allowance, called a taxi from the Yellow Pages um, nearest to our house. And so the taxi came, we went to the orphanage, I asked him to please wait, and um, walked in and said to the mother superior at the desk, my name is such and such, and I've come to adopt an orphan. Um, and I have a lovely place uh, where she would be terribly happy. Uh, horses and dogs and walks and she would really love it. And she looked at me absolutely stunned and said, I'm so sorry, my dear, but um, 
you're just too young for us to allow you to um, adopt a child. When my mother came back about a week later, I just got such hell for this. How you could upset me, how you could do, torture me the way you have. Uh, we were so worried about you, I couldn't figure out quite why that was as they were in Chile on a motorboat. Can you talk about meeting, how you met Peter that summer in Greece? Well, when my sister asked me to come and recover after uh, a big operation uh, to Scorpios and have my own house there and the children, etc., it sounded like the ideal place to recuperate. And she already had asked Peter Beard, who she knew, um, to come and amuse her children with painting, with sculpting, with skiing. They just adored it. His mess was everywhere in the house of his collages, photographs, just all over every floor. And uh, he was always on his knees, gluing or rubbing a pen into his arm to get blood to put on his paintings. <laughs> And then we'd go off at the end of my recuperation and water ski for hours when the incredible heat had go gone down. And there were just, it was just paradise because in those days, so few boats were around that you had at least a hundred beaches to yourself. When we'd get back to New York, he'd often sleep in his station wagon. He was superb looking and I had a body of a Greek god. It was always the same color tan and always an opinion and an extraordinary costume that only he could get away with. He just gave me so many more interests and so much more curiosity about possibilities. Can you talk about that summer in Montana? in Montauk, in Andy's house. And that was because uh, Peter knew Andy very well. And <laughs> Andy just bought it and never spent a night there. And um, it was really roughing it, but it was in the sea. And I adored that. I remember asking you about Grey Gardens and your cousin and Anne, did they, was that in the Hamptons near where you're from? It was. It was in East Hampton. And it was my idea when Stash and I lived in England at Cherville to um, go back to East Hampton, which I had so much nostalgia about as a child, and um, have my um, extremely eccentric aunt be the narrator for my memories um, and she had a wonderful singing voice um, and she, <laughs> she'd say anything her imagination was quite extraordinary and her daughter Edie little Edie we always called her um, was almost as eccentric as a and child she, was she eccentric? Even as a child, was she very eccentric? No, not at all. She graduated from Harvard. It was when her mother locked her up as her companion at Grey Gardens, and she never left East Hampton for 25 years. Uh, so I thought it would be a wonderful idea to go back there. I said, it'll take days, weeks to get into that house. They won't let us. And so right. Peter said, we'll get the Maisels because they have 16 millimeter cameras and the, the Beals won't be frightened of that. And the Maisels, I think, will be charmed by them. And the Beals were terribly attracted by the Maisels because they adore to have their picture taken. And they adored to scream at one another uh, constantly. And they said, listen, <laughs> we don't want this to be an Edie narrating for you, for your nostalgia. 
we can really make something extraordinary out of this. Well, it took me weeks of drives from Montauk to East, their house in East Hampton to get them to um, open the door. And so one doesn't just knock on the door and have it opened? Even if oh, no, no, you. no, no. You bang and you scream. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about analysis? No. <laughs> nice <laughs> try, Sophia. Okay. <laughs> I'm always struck by how incredibly strong, we've talked about this, how incredibly strong and willful you are, and yet how um, you maintain this sort of childlike sense of curiosity and joy and that you're quite adventurous and naughty, and also, I guess, a bit vulnerable. Um, I don't see why you can't be both. Do you see yourself as strong? Yes, I do. And I see myself as vulnerable. You're just engaged with life and with people and with art and with culture. Well, otherwise I wouldn't want to live. Um, if you weren't engaged and curious and... Yeah, if I wasn't curious, yeah. I wouldn't want to live. And as Luis Buñuel said in the beginning of his book, Apropos of His Mother, um, without memory, there is no life. And um, that's the way I'd feel. Mm -hmm. Soon. <laughs> no.